The challenge of virtually any RPG that dares to stray from the universal position of medieval fantasy is immense. Anything that doesn't rest on the well-understood pseudo-historical premise of what games like Dungeons & Dragons tend to explore needs to do extra work to transcend the status of a novelty game and a novelty experience. Whether or not Numenera is a novelty game or is instead what I would argue, and in some ways is the point of this channel, an experience that sits at the middle of a Venn diagram of science fiction and fantasy interests is a prime topic for wide discussion, and in this video I hope to highlight what is perhaps one of the most essential chapters of the core book Numenera Discovery, and in doing so, help frame and guide expectations of the experiences on offer from these books. The chapter in question, it would seem, is intended to help guide GMs closer to the vision Numenera has in mind, and as such could be seen as a bit too much of a peek behind the curtain for players. But just as we get excited from seeing production footage from an upcoming movie or television show, I'd argue that at the very least reading this chapter can also give players an idea of the kinds of games and the kinds of liberties and freedoms the setting of the Ninth World can deliver for an RPG. Ostensibly reserved for a portion of the book meant to speak directly and perhaps only to GMs, Chapter 22, Realizing the Ninth World, is I'd argue one of the first chapters anyone, player or GM, ought to read, whether or not they think they fully understand the game and its setting. You may even wish to consider pausing this video now to read or skim that chapter before going further, or this video may also serve as a primer for engaging with that text. I am of the mind that every game's setting and lore ought to be deconstructed, broken down, and used for all manner of purposes, particularly ones that go in the opposite direction of what's expected. But before one can learn to break the rules, understanding them is essential. Numenera prompts a lot of questions for prospective players who find interest in hearing the initial premise of a game set a billion years into the future. Is it a science fiction game? Is it a futuristic game? Is it a game that focuses on high technology, or is it just sci-fi? Once the initial questions have been answered, it's likely that more will remain. Upon hearing that the game is set a billion years into the future after what are believed to be eight grand civilizations that have come and gone, there are often questions about 21st century humanity, the individual eight civilizations, how the technology works, whether the order of truth are protagonists or antagonists, and more. I would suggest that the answers to these questions, to the best that they can be answered, are often found while playing the game. These are questions filtered through a spectrum of the unknown and the weird, always with the understanding that we may not fully be able to piece together or understand what our characters have experienced. This works to activate the parts of our mind that get excited about mystery and wonder, embrace all of the opportunities that leaping into the unknown may bring, and the realization that in reflecting on something that is inherently unknowable, the only true frontier we can hope to understand is that of our own characters' experiences and who they became as they experienced them. The theater of Numenera rests on curiosity about its world and its people. It rests on the players, GMs, and characters not having all the answers and perhaps never getting them. And what can be understood very directly is that this is somewhat of a creative challenge. This is in fact right there in the opening paragraph of chapter 22. Building stories in the ninth world can seem challenging. Portraying a world one billion years in the future can be daunting. And the first challenge, I believe, is understanding that the notion of a billion years in the future is really more of a qualitative description of the setting than it is quantitative. It is not a game where you need to understand the lore to participate, and we can start breaking that down by really understanding that the expression of a billion years into the future is just that, an expression, not a calculation. We are expressing unfathomable time in order to remove ourselves as much as we possibly can from 21st century humanity and from 21st century societies. As D&D is the theater of medieval fantasy concepts, the performance of familiar stories of heroes and villains and good and evil and victory and demise, Numenera aims to tap into the theater of gazing into a night sky and wondering what lies out there, or of seeing the remnants of a long-lost civilization and not fully understanding the purpose or means by which what is left behind was made. We are removed from truly understanding what we experience by time and perhaps our own mortality, and yet we yearn for answers, or we desire to sit and remain within the space carved out by the unknown so that we may dwell in wonder. Not merely wonder for the sake of scientific 
scientific fields of study that aim to categorize and study these things, though that may be a part of it, but because of a feeling that is often quite universal, the human reaction to the unknown, to mystery, the act of wondering, the, as Carl Sagan put it in the original Cosmos, our own contemplations of what we don't understand that stir us and bring about a tingling of the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a great height, we know we are approaching the grandest of mysteries. This, I'd argue, is the quote-unquote magic system of Numenera. It's not about powers or schools of magic or other things that mostly funnel into one's capacity to destroy things and attack NPC targets, but rather the reactions that we have to a world that we cannot fully understand. A world our characters may struggle to truly understand. The crunch of Numenera is to sit with the unknown and to let mystery guide and shape the narrative. Sagan's description of what he referred to as the cosmos feels as though it would be right at home in Numenera. It's a setting with a size and age that's beyond ordinary human understanding, lost somewhere between immensity and eternity, as he might have put it. Playing Numenera might require us to be a little bit more humble about what we do and do not know. We have to admit a potential weakness, that we may not understand the events of the game, the setting, or maybe even the game itself. It can, of course, be run as a familiar RPG experience where magic is just actually hyper-advanced technology, and where adventures consist of heroes. Our stories at the table may have traditional styles of play and storytelling, but at a minimum, on the far horizon is an unanswerable question that evades being quantified. The Numenera itself, the mysterious remnants left behind that are now long removed from their original purpose, will ever escape our grasp of understanding. And so while a Numenera adventure may dare to challenge that, may dare to step into that horizon and embrace the endless landscape of unending mystery, we are also free to allow the mystery to rest in its state of the unknown so that we can focus on the personalities at the table, the people we meet and interact with, who the story gets told through. The excitement of playing Numenera, regardless of the nature of the narrative in question, always rests on the unknown, where we place ourselves before something that we don't fully understand, and through the lens of a role-playing game, we tell a story about the characters and the events that come out of this place of unknowing, of wandering into a place beyond our wildest possible notions of reality, where the limits of human consciousness and sentience may be tested, and where our expectations meet an unpredictable reality. With all of this talk of the unknown, of mystery, and an inability to possibly understand the setting of Numenera, we ought to not lose sight of the constraints the game puts forth in order to sustain mystery and wonder. But if you needed proof of why explaining things or going into lore dives is not often the best course of action in this game, or perhaps at the very least for science fantasy as a genre, one only needs to reflect on how Star Wars Episode I added explanation and understanding for the Force that was deeply disappointing in comparison to the mystery and wonder of the original films. The Matrix Reloaded struggled when it decided to grant its audience an enormous exposition dump on the inner framework of how its virtual world worked, something which relied on stilted philosophical word salad that made the entire scene unapproachable for many, despite being narratively consistent in a number of ways, it began to devour its initial premise of a world that made us question whether or not we really knew what we were being told, only to be told about the world by the film. Prometheus, with whatever story it was trying to tell, wasn't satisfying in its full lore dive, or what that may have been, about the space jockeys and their relationship to whatever is going on in this film. When the Force in Star Wars remains something esoteric and unpredictable, we're captivated by it and wish to experience its mystery in some way. When the Matrix appears to be a system of control that we struggle to comprehend, we are terrified by the implications. And when we enter an alien spacecraft to gaze upon objects and people far out of time and place, we reflect on the reality that we as humans are potentially powerless in comprehending where we sit in the ultimate canon of deep time and history. This is what makes Alien so terrifying, not merely its form, not merely its capacity to kill, but that it is walking proof that the universe is older and stranger than we could ever realize. It could be that the Force comes from midichlorians, or that the system of the Matrix factored in human rebellion, or that whatever happened in Prometheus happened in Prometheus, and in Numenera games we may get the answer of some of these deep questions about ourselves or the world, but it's clear from these examples that exposition and lore dives and endless quantification are perhaps a dessert saved for far after the vegetables of the weird have been thoroughly enjoyed. 
Chapter 22 of Numenera Discovery provides not only blueprints for keeping mystery alive and well, but also gives a sense of what players ought to expect. The challenge may not be how many Ravage Bears you can kill, but instead is a challenge of understanding a strange experience where time and space stopped being what you assumed it to be, and that the Ravage Bears are merely another manifestation of the weird around us not a creature type to be factored into a challenge rating system. There are endless numbers of ways of doing this, but Numenera is very clear about what its constraints and goalposts are. Constraints and goalposts that give you parameters to work with and something to work toward in the game. The book, and particularly chapter 22, is clear that the weird shouldn't necessarily be weird for the sake of weird. Numenera is set on Earth a billion years in the future for a reason. We as players have the meta-knowledge of knowing Earth and our sense of reality. The weirdness then stems from seeing phenomena of the previous worlds that divorce us from any kind of understanding, and from the fact that no player should truly ever feel like they understand everything around them. Be that in terms of a game's more higher narrative concepts or the complexity of the world and the game and the descriptions themselves. As is described in the book, when a PC comes upon a control panel and figures out what a few of the controls do, there will always be far more buttons and dials that they do not understand. Save quantification and explanation for the rules and mechanics of the cipher system, of defining things like edge and effort and easing and hindering, but leave the stories, rhetoric, and narrative to exist in states of uncertainty, where each meeting at the table is an acknowledgement that we don't know what will happen and we may never fully understand what happened. That appears to be central to what Numenera is about. In many ways, it's a game of letting go of our need to be in control and know everything. Because of this, we are left with perhaps the only thing we can know and be grounded in during a session of Numenera. As Monty Cook himself put it, when the world is too big to define, categorize, and understand, then all we can try to understand is ourselves. It could be that understanding the scientific perspectives of the Jedi Order as they are depicted in Episode 1 might lead to an interesting story of how their social constructions allowed Anakin to slip through the cracks, as could understanding the layers and depth of the construction of the Matrix might lead to a better contextualization of the struggle of humanity. But what's clear is that having these exposition dumps, these lore dives, this strict quantification alone didn't do these movies any favors. One only needs to look at the public reception of them to see what happens in real time when you drain the mystery of something by quantifying it, particularly in ways that are jarring. Though there is a lot to say in defense of the narrative choices The Matrix Reloaded took and where it went with them, but that's a topic for another time and place. This video doesn't intend to reproduce the content in Chapter 22, which you should absolutely take the time to read. What it hopes to do is demonstrate why Numenera prioritizes the weird and the unknown, because when we do that, we leave the space necessary for the players at the table to take more ownership of the experience. A lot is often said about how the Cypher system grants a high degree of player agency, and mechanically that's true, but it should be no surprise that this system developed out of Numenera, which aimed to narratively empower players by giving them the freedom to truly define who their characters are. If they see fantastic phenomena with a rational explanation underneath but still use magical or spiritual means of expressing what they experienced, that is as valid as an Aeon priest providing a strict explanation for how it works, because we all know the real answer to a mysterious Numenera phenomena might reside somewhere in the middle or something far beyond our capacity to understand. And without explanation, we are only offered experience. Numenera is about the experience, about the description, about the act of gaming and what that brings out of us as players and GMs sharing a story about a wild and unpredictable futurescape. Unpredictable technologies and the remnants of processes that forever warped how biology, physics, and chemistry likely work allow narrative and mechanical freedom. By following the guidance in chapter 22 on why and how to maintain the weird through descriptions over definitions, players and characters come to define the world through their experience. They aren't being preached to, they're being listened to. They are the authors of this story as much as the GM running the game is, and as much as Monty Cook Games is in writing and publishing these books. Yes, there is fictional lore to be found for the Ninth World in these books. Numenera Discovery and Destiny, as well as the litany of setting supplements over the years, offer a take on what this world might look like. 
It's a collection of names, loose historical and political situations, and concepts that are likely to be interesting enough for you to want to visit them in your games. But the spirit of them is what's most important, and that is always the spirit of the unknown. We are asked as players and GMs to react to what we experience, not what we know about the setting or the game. One of the most commonly heard reactions to any Numenera book concerns the art. MCG has gone above and beyond in choosing the right artists to portray the visual representation of this world because so much of this art on display works to inspire that mental wanderlust that Carl Sagan often talked about. But instead of natural phenomena, these are fictional realms where we aren't bound by the limitations of our current 21st century understanding of the universe. The feeling and excitement, the wonder that the art in Numenera books inspire is the invitation we need to follow. And this is all achieved without knowing exactly what we're looking at. We aren't ever really told what the monoliths do. We don't know for certain what lies beyond a certain ruin. The books don't necessarily dictate these things fully. Rather, they do it through their art and language. They inspire us to go into the game to find out what they are to the best of our abilities. Every work of art in these books is an invitation to discovery and to wonder, and in the art's wide depiction of humanity through inclusive and intentional decisions to represent as many of us as it can, it's clear that the destination of wonder is meant for all of us. While much of the first half of chapter 22 focuses on this kind of questioning about discovery, about wonder, and about what we do with narratives where the point is mystery, the unknown, and the weird, the second half gets a bit more technical and is perhaps what is needed for those who find the setting to not be concrete enough. Numenera, in a lot of ways, can work with science fiction and science fantasy much in the same way that D&D works with medieval fantasy. Where D&D can sometimes feel like the Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones or the Wheel of Time, providing a place where we can all participate in that wider umbrella of the fantasy genre, Numenera can serve as something that maybe feels like Star Wars or Alien or Star Trek or Halo or even many Final Fantasy entries, bringing together different stories under the larger umbrella of science fantasy for us to play with at the table, because the setting gets out of our way in determining critical elements of the lore. We're free to bring that which inspires us in science fiction and science fantasy and use that as the playable theater we call a role-playing game. The latter half of this chapter does provide what you need if you want to have more quantification ahead of time. It speculates what a Numenera adventure would be like if it were more of a post-apocalyptic game, a horror setting, a sci-fi adventure, or as the chapter suggests, perhaps all of these at the same time. It goes a bit into the different kinds of technology that are likely to exist in the game and speculates how it might work in the setting of the Ninth World, meaning how people might view these technologies and what words they're likely to use for them. What they exactly do and how they function is really up to you as a GM or player, and it might be something that flows out naturally from the game, something that's discovered in the game. In the spirit of the chapter, and of the game for that matter, chapter 22 won't tell you how nanotechnology works in the game, but it will offer guidance for what nanotechnology makes possible in terms of world building and storytelling, and it does this for a number of categories of technology. The chapter also contains a number of adventure ideas with a couple of charts and specific scenarios that for many tables is enough to spawn an entire adventure in a free-flowing improv style or provide the seeds for a GM or player who likes to thoroughly detail their world or backstory. Chapter 22 provides you with the fuel needed to power the kinds of mysteries and weird tales that challenge you and your characters narratively and mechanically. It is one of the first chapters you ought to consider reading before playing. Numenera is a weird game, there's no doubt about it, but it's not just weird because the setting is weird, nor is it weird to just be weird. It becomes weird because the language in play prioritizes mystery and the unknown. It's a strange light on the horizon calling to us, perhaps an optical illusion, perhaps a very specific function of an ancient machine buried below the ground, perhaps a warning, or perhaps a symbol of one's true calling. Numenera is about sustaining the parts of our mind that light up when a mysterious phenomenon begs us to understand it. Yet, we know that we might only be able to catch barely a glimpse of what we truly experienced. And in that, we find the freedom to tell original stories with original characters who, much like us, are caught in the space of the unknown. Thank you so much for watching this video, and if you enjoyed what you saw, please consider subscribing to The Infinite Construct for more Numenera and Cypher System videos.